five. Uh, Dr. Campbell here with your very last session uh, for this term. Uh, these seven weeks have gone by pretty quickly. So for our week seven um, coding guidelines, we're really going to be focusing on um, obviously continuing uh, with the coding process in terms of learning how to utilize the manual um, as well as applying guidelines and then of course we have our coding roundtable. So for this week we're going to be looking at the external causes of morbidity and then we also are going to look at factors that are influencing health status. Um, the good thing is that we've actually already utilized these codes before, so this week should be pretty smooth sailing uh, in terms of looking up codes. So um, for the external causes of morbidity, these codes actually can show five different things. Um, number one, they can show the cause of a health condition or an injury. They can also show whether a situation was intentional or was it unintentional or was it a suicide um, um, event. Uh, we can show the place where the event occurred. We can show the activity of the patient at the time of the event and then we can also show their status um, specifically looking at if they are a civilian or military. Um, every time I, I think about um, these codes, I, I think about all of the horrible things um, that are happening um, in our country today. Um, my husband says that I, I like to associate everything uh, related to coding, but I, I just think it's just it's a part of who we are. So um, thinking about um, events that have happened recently, um, such as the uh, the horrible, horrible, horrible event um, that took place this weekend in Orlando, we could actually utilize these codes um, to show the external causes of the injury that individuals um, may have had. So the way that you want to remember it is that these codes are really um, secondary in nature. Uh, some states require them, some do not. Um, but they really can tell a story, not only, uh, for example, that a, a person had a fracture um, with our regular diagnosis codes, but these codes can show the cause. You know, so it was it was it was due to gun violence. Um, we can identify the place, the nightclub um, that the event actually occurred. Um, the patient's activity. The patient was a patron um, of that club on that particular day. So these codes provide us with a lot of data relative to. Um, situations that happen. Um, moving away from that traumatic event, uh, we could also do show things like motor vehicle accidents. So something is very common and we all are, uh, most of us are guilty of this, um, using our cell phone to text or send emails while we're driving. So the these codes can show um, that the accident was caused um, by someone on their cell phone. Um, when you think about um, all of our um, our troops that are out there serving our country, um, any injury that they have, we could actually show the external cause um, as well as we can show their status being military. So one thing that you should know, and I will remind you about, we talked about this the very first week, the external causes has its own injury. I'm sorry, own index. And so the index is um, after the first three parts. So the index to external or index to diseases, the um, neoplasm table, the table of drugs um, is at the very end. And so um, I have provided in the files area um, main terms in the um, external cause index to help you locate the codes. The external co um, cause index is not a very large area so it should not be too difficult to locate codes and um, many of you <laughs> have already started assigning these codes when I was looking at some of the the week six quizzes last week I saw that several of you had started to um, explore into um, into this particular area. 
Um, there are lots of guidelines related to this area. You'll want to make sure that you review them um, because there are some sequencing requirements um, that you need to be aware of. And I, I just want to remind you again, these codes are never used as the principal or first listed code. You have to have one of our injury codes first. These codes show the external cause of that injury or the patient's health condition. Uh, we can show, you know, something happened in the operating room. So um, when you get a chance um, sooner than later, just just take a look at this index and look at all the all the possible options. You'll be surprised. Um, every time I look at the um, external cause index, <laughs> I just automatically start to think about lions and tigers and bears. Oh my, because in the index, you're going to see all sorts of things. Um, alligators. Somebody was bit by an alligator. Um, someone, it's summertime here in Chicago, so everyone is out mowing their lawn. So we can see that someone was cut by a lawnmower. You could even show cut by a lawnmower, and this was that person's job, as opposed to, you know, the homeowner cutting their own lawn. Okay. So then the next um, area are the factors influencing health status. And we have seen these codes um, before um, um, this week. Um, these are our Z codes. Remember, we've had several situations where we've utilized the Z codes, the allergies, uh, the history of certain conditions. So again, this week is really just kind of wrapping up the tabular list and, and going into these areas. Um, really, this probably should have been um, probably should have been first. Uh, and so it's last, and so it should be a little easier for you to tackle it. Um, in the files area, I have identified for you uh, a list of main terms in the alphabetical index that lead to Z codes. And I encourage you to take these lists that I've created and print them out and expand on them. So if you find a, a unique way to locate a Z code, maybe you were struggling to locate that, that particular code, um, having this list that you continue to grow over the years will prove to be very helpful. Okay, so um, because we have covered um, Z codes before, you have been provided with the list of main terms that lead to the Z codes. I'm not going to um, go through any of the guidelines because um, you, you, you should at this point be very familiar. But again, for our last two chapters, very important that you read the guidelines. Um, for example, some of our Z codes can be first listed or principal. Some of our Z codes have to be in the secondary position. Um, an example that I can think of the last couple of weeks that we've had where um, the day that a baby was born, the day that a woman gave birth, uh, one of her secondary codes would be the outcome of delivery. Whereas on the baby's record, the baby is born, hi, I'm here, world, and their Z code goes first. So some Z codes go first, some go second, and the guidelines actually provide you with a list of those particular, um, of those particular areas. Okay, so uh, let's see here. Round table. This is our last round table for the term. So. Um, as always, I have to give my little disclaimer that um, while there may be other conditions that can be coded, the tips are going to provide you with the floor of what can be coded, um, not the ceiling. In your workplace, your employer will provide you with guidance on what they want you to code above and beyond um, codes that are captured for reimbursement purposes. They may have you uh, pick up the history of everything under the sun. Um, it really just depends on your organization. Um, something else I think is very important. You want to make sure that you review the entire record. Yes, I understand that some of the pages are typed, some of the pages are handwritten, but let me just tell you, you don't know where you're going to be working and what type of record setup they're going to have. And so, um, you may work somewhere where all they have are um, 
handwritten records. And don't worry, the more you look at a particular um, physician's handwriting, you will find that um, you will definitely get used to um, get used to their handwriting, and it, it won't be um, it won't be as difficult as it is today. Uh, keep in mind that inpatient coders are um, coding two to three records an hour, um, so they are coding more in a day than you've coded in this two week in this seven week period. But again, keep in mind that you are just learning this process, okay? And I, I want to commend you guys. You guys have done a great job of, you know, utilizing your resources. I want to remind you about coding clinic and guidelines. You have access to those resources uh, as long as you're enrolled in the program. Definitely take a look at them. If I were you, um, I definitely would look at all of the ICD-10 coding clinics while you have access to them because you never know wh where you're going to be working at. You may not have access to those to those references, and um, you you want to ensure that you um, know what you know have exposed yourself to uh, what is available in those documents. All right, so let's talk about the first case, case number eight. So the first case, uh, case number eight, uh, the principal diagnoses and the um, admitting diagnoses are exactly the same. Um, what's so interesting about this week is that last week we talked about sequencing of um, those codes that start with the letter T. And so coincidentally, um, our principal, diagnosis for this patient is a patient that has the infection following the procedure. It's a T81 code. So um, as far as secondary diagnoses, the patient has a total of seven of them. Uh, one is a Y code. Those are those external cause codes. And two of them are Z codes. So let's look at what we have. We have um, a secondary diagnosis of cellulitis. We, um, this patient actually has a couple of organisms, so we have E. coli, um, we have um, bactericide, um, and I may be saying that word wrong, so let me um, look in the record and spell it. B-A-C-T-E-O-I-D-E-S, fragilis, bacteriides fragilis, okay? Um, the patient also has uh, the candidiasis of the mouth, so that's called um, candid, candidial stomatitis, stoma meaning an opening or the mouth. Um, your, your Y code is going to be um, a surgical operation as the cause of a reaction. You're going to have a Z code that shows the history of the malignant neoplasm. Remember, we talked about this first, watch out for the personal history versus the family history codes. You always want to make sure this patient had a personal history of a malignant carcinoma of the uh, colon. Also, um, this patient has an acquired absence of an organ. Um, I'm pretty sure we've coded this before, but if not, you have your list of main terms that lead to your Z code, so you should be able to find uh, the acquired absence. Uh, this patient has five procedures. I've actually listed for you here on the slides where those five procedures are listed are, yeah, in the record, but you have um, an incision and drainage, and we're going to code all of these just you know for the practice again. Each week, we're giving you um, exposure to um, these medical records for purposes of learning the process. So there may be some things this week that we picked up that you may be thinking that um, could be coded with the charge master. And again, every facility is different. You're at the DeVry Hospital facility. And so for this week, we want to code the incision and drainage. We want to code um, the wound irrigation. We want to code the packing. We want to code the drains that were removed. And then we also want to code the staple removal. 
So that's all for case number eight. The PowerPoint slides for this session are uploaded into the files area as well. There should be a total of three files. Okay, um, for case number 32, the patient with the acute epididymitis. So um, our principal, also our admitting diagnosis, is the uh, acute epididymitis. Um, the patient also has a post-procedural urethral stitcher. They also have a urinary tract infection. And when you verify urinary tract infection in the um, index, it tells you to use an additional code for the organism. And we happen to know that the organism is the uh, E. coli. And then for this patient, we have um, three Z codes. Um, we have more uh, acquired abscesses. So we have an acquired absence um, of a genital organ. We have an acquired absence of the digestive tract organ. And then this patient also has an allergy to um, penicillin. As a reminder, uh, things like diagnostic imaging, x-rays, EKGs, etc., those are not typically coded with inpatient coding. Those are captured by the charge master. And typically when they're captured by the charge master, they are captured um, with a CPT code. So for this case, there are no procedures. All right, so that is all for week number seven. And as promised, I'm going to um, give you a review for the final exam. Um, I will not be uploading, um, I will not be able to provide you with a copy of these slides. And for some reason, I am having trouble uh, uploading this file. So just give me one second. I may have to open the file and uh, share my, my screen. So just give me one second to do that. So, um, as a reminder, there is a final exam study guide in the doc sharing area. Um, but what I'm going to give you um, are a little bit more specifics um, on the um, final exam, things that you need to know. So, I'm going to open up my, uh, my computer here, my screen, and you'll be able to see. Okay, so alrighty, so uh, let's go ahead and get started with the final exam review. Okay, so multiple choice. Yes, of course, you're going to have some multiple choice questions. Um, in the final exam review document, you'll be able to see how many questions you're going to have and all that good stuff. I'm just going to go over uh, the content that you um, need to know. So, um, uh oh, okay, my slides are having a mind of its own. Okay, so for the uh, multiple choice, you're going to have some coding questions, multiple choice coding. So you'll want to pay close attention to the sequencing because you know if you put your codes, if you have the right codes, but they're in the wrong order, it's wrong. Uh, prime example, last week we talked about adverse effects um, compared to poisoning um, and how those codes should be sequenced. So if you are looking at a scenario and you're like, hey, these codes, these are the same codes in both options. One is sequenced before the other. There must be a guideline I need to pay attention to. Um, you also will have some questions related to uh, present on admission indicators. Uh, remember uh, a few weeks ago how we did that? Um, we kind of played a little game where you had to guess the, the POA indicator. Um, as, you know, kind of a review, I would take a look at um, that particular area um, just, just, just to review. Okay, um, you also need to be aware of which codes are combination codes and which codes are not um, because that's going to be very important. And um, a perfect example of a combination code um, is a patient 
that has um, a diabetic cataract. Um, that is a situation that has a cat has a combination code. One thing that you should know, um, just because we have a, a combo code that says diabetic cataract, that doesn't mean we can automatically assume that if we see the word diabetes for the patient and we see cataract that they are linked. The doctor actually has to state diabetic cataract. There's actually um, a coding clinic uh, related to uh, that type of situation. Um, you also need to be familiar with the coding conventions. You know, your C, your C also, your um, your NEC, your NOS, use additional code, code first. Make sure that you are aware. Go back and read chapter one if you have to, because that's where you, you've learned that information. All right, um, short answer questions. So um, in week number one, you had a chapter on reimbursement. Go back and read that particular chapter because you are going to need to know about payments to Medicare. Um, you also are going to need to know about um, the RAC reviews. Um, you also are going to need to know about the rules, the reviews that are done by our uh, fiscal intermediaries and our Medicare administrative contractors. Uh, chap that chapter also covered um, quality improvement organizations. Okay, um, Multiple choice, you had to know about POA. Um, in the uh, short answer, you got to know about the POA again. What do I need to look at? Go and look at um, your POA guidelines. Again, go and look at that, um, that, that particular live lecture where we went over um, the POA indicators. Okay, you also need to know about the query process and specifically the six reasons why we query. Now, you were provided with two documents um, related to the query process. So hear me very clearly about this. You were given two documents, okay? One of them was from 2013, which is the um, guidelines for achieving a compliant query process. And then the, the one that was published in 2008 was uh, managing an effective query process. So in the managing an effective query process document, you will find the six reasons that we query. So um, make sure that you are aware of those six reasons why we query as stated in managing an effective query process, that article. Um, the placeholder X in week number one, chapter number one. We talked about the use of the placeholder X. You've actually had to use the placeholder X uh, in the last couple of weeks. So make sure that you know um, the reasons why we would use a placeholder of X. All right. Um, continuing more from chapter, the chapter on reimbursement, the final chapter uh, in the textbook. Um, they talk about the MSDRG. You need to know the goal of the MSDRG. You need to know the MSDRG assignment. You need to know about the base payment rate for MSDRG. That chapter um, at the end of the book, I think it's chapter 24, it has so much information in it. Um, and you definitely want to make sure that you know that for the um, for the final. Um, chapter 24 also covered uh, medical necessity. So you need to make sure that you know that. Um, chapter one, we talked about the basic steps of coding. We talked about eight basic steps of coding. Make sure that you know those steps. Now, also, let me give you a tip. There is no need for you to go on the internet to find the answers for the final exam. Everything that you need to know is in your coding book and your textbook. If you go to the internet and and retrieve information, you're gonna you're gonna find that you may get some questions wrong um, because we're not looking for you to do a Google search to do your to to complete your quiz. So, textbook and coding manuals all you need. You do not need to use the 3M encoder. Um, the UHDDS. So um, also in week number one. 
um, you learned about um, you learned about the UHDDS guidelines. So you learned about the four cooperating parties. So you need to be familiar with those four cooperating parties. You need to know about the definition of principal diagnoses versus secondary diagnoses. You also need to know about how we code situations when the original treatment plan is not carried out. Again, let me emphasize, the only resources that you need to have are your coding manual and your textbook. Um, for short answer, you are going to have some coding questions. Here's the cool thing. The coding questions are just like the ones from the quizzes. There are no medical records that you need to code, so you can take a deep breath um, in knowing that you won't have to do that on the quiz, but you will need to make sure that you know guidelines for complications, late effects, and burns. That was last week. You also need to know about guidelines for birth weight and gestation. Which one comes first per the guideline? You also need to make sure that you code the outcome of delivery. You also need to remember about coding infections with organisms. Remember in uh, the coding roundtable that I went over for week number seven, you had the patient that had the urinary tract infection um, and you had um, to pick up an additional code for the E. coli. Okay, um, you also need to know about um, benign prostatic hypertrophy and lower urinary tract symptoms. So you want to make sure that you know how to code that. Also, hypertension and heart disease. Remember, the guidelines state in order to code hypertension and heart disease as that combo code, there has to be a relationship uh, demonstrated between those two situations. Okay, let's see what else I got. Um, you also need to know how to code the sequela of a CVA. Again, I cannot overemphasize. Do not look for this information on the internet. Utilize your coding manual, which has your guidelines in it, and then also make sure that you are um, utilizing your textbook. So um, how we code and encounter for chemotherapy. Um, on the short answer, I will tell you that there is no procedure codes. So and actually, um, in the, the exam itself, there are no uh, volume three procedure codes. So you don't have to even worry about that. Um, neoplasms, when we have a primary and a secondary, there are guidelines for sequencing, guidelines for uh, signs and symptoms, guidelines for um, how we call it an elective abortion. Again, be familiar with your conventions, your instructional notes, code first, use additional code, C, C also, make sure that you know those. And that was actually the end uh, of this session. Uh, again, um, I will, I'm not able to provide you with a copy of the final exam PowerPoint slides, uh, but this session was recorded and you can play it as many times as your hearts desire. So I wish everyone um, good luck on the final exam and good luck next uh, term. As a reminder, we do have a week off the last week in June. We do not have class, so that gives us all an opportunity to um, get some rest and regroup for our July term. So thank you guys so much. Bye-bye.